It's not news to anyone. Water is an essential resource for human beings. Whether it's for drinking, cooking, or even agriculture, water needs to be clean for human consumption. Looking at the numbers, Swiss people seem very confident in the quality of their tap water. But when asked about the evolution of water quality over time and a form we sent out, 50% of Swiss people said that they thought it would get worse. Why is that? Hi, I'm Julian. Welcome to EPFL's 2020 iGEM team presentation video. By watching this, you will get a complete overview of our project, what we're trying to achieve, why and how. The idea for our project came when we discovered that recently many local newspapers wrote articles about the presence of chlorothalonil in groundwaters. Our team then started looking deeper into the subject of pesticides and other pollutants in groundwaters. We found out that chlorothalonil is not an exception but merely the tip of an iceberg. Because of intensive agriculture, many types of pesticides end up polluting the water by evaporation, seepage into groundwaters, or even surface runoffs that end up in rivers or lakes. As we wanted our project to tackle the issue of chlorothalonil and other pesticides found in groundwaters, we decided to contact multiple local institutes whose role is to regulate water quality. The Association des Fontainiers de Suisse Romande is an association whose members, that are called les fontainiers, or the fountaineers, are called to help regulate local water facilities. We interviewed Quentin Moretti, the president of this association, to know more about their stance on the chlorothalonil issue. This is what we learned. For large cities, water is being tested on almost a daily basis. But for smaller communities, villages, water tests are being done only twice a year. This is because they lack the financial resources to be either connected to larger networks or to perform frequent tests. Looking at our survey, people expect their water to be tested on a monthly basis, which is not the case for these communities. As well, these tests can take time as they are being conducted in specialized facility and require trained personnel. If these villages are near an agricultural zone, then their groundwaters have a large chance to get polluted. And with the lack of frequent testing, without even getting detected. But identifying the source of the pollution is necessary to avoid permanent contamination of the source of water, which can take years to rejuvenate. To summarize, the Fontainiers need a solution that is local, easy to use, affordable, to help them perform more frequent testing. We found a solution adapted to everyone. The espresso. What is it? Let's find out. The espresso is a small, easy to use, low cost DIY device that provides general preliminary tests of water quality. But beyond the device, the espresso is also a system that has as its center genetically modified organisms that has been engineered to detect the presence of pollutants in water. This system has especially been conceived for non-trained users so that the Fontenier Association can benefit from the power of synthetic biology without facing the difficulties of result interpretation, safety or waste management, but has also been designed to be accessible for any community in the world. Let's learn more about the bio behind the espresso with Sven, our representative of the bio department. The biological aspect of our project was inspired by the cannery in the coal mine analogy. Miners would use to carry a cannery in a cage with them. The bird being more sensitive to toxic gases such as carbon monoxide would become sick or die before the miners. This was used as a warning mechanism and would allow the miners to escape before any serious harm was done to them. We tried to translate this concept and apply it to the problem of drinking water pollution. The hypothesis was that if a chemical compound in water is harmful to humans, maybe it is also harmful to other living organisms. 
we decided to work with Saccharomyces cerevisiae as this type of yeast is robust and its growth behavior can easily be monitored. To do so, we measured growth curves on a plate reader. This instrument measures the optical density, which is correlated to the number of cells in a sample. We took measurements every 10 minutes for more than 18 hours, and by plotting the optical density versus time, we were able to compare growth curves of yeast strains in different conditions to find out whether or not yeast could be used as a sentinel strain to detect the presence of pesticides in water. We repeated the same experiment, but this time we added pesticides. There exist many classes of pesticides and we had to decide which ones of them we were going to use for our experiments. We read in a report on long-term water quality monitoring in Switzerland that the phytosanitary products most frequently found in Switzerland were atrazine, pentason and metolachlor. We found that high concentrations of certain pesticides lead to a much longer lag phase, which simply means the yeast would start to grow later. The problem we were facing now was sensitivity. In fact, the concentrations we used for our experiments were much higher than what could be expected in reality. To solve this problem, we started thinking about how we could engineer yeast to increase its sensitivity. Thanks to decades of research, we happen to know that this organism has a pathway for general stress response. This pathway gets activated under conditions such as carbon source starvation, heat shock, but also osmotic or oxidative stresses. The pathway is controlled by master regulators such as MSN2 and YAP1 that are usually found outside of the nucleus. When the stress signal is sensed, they enter the nucleus under stress conditions where they start to activate their target gene. Our first idea to render the organism more sensitive towards environmental stresses was to test what would happen if these transcriptional mass regulators of stress response were knocked out. We observed that if we added pesticides to these strains, the lag time would increase more than it had increased when we used wild-type yeast. This result was interesting because if the effect was bigger, it means that probably it will also be easier to measure it on our own device. The second idea was a bit more ambitious. We wanted to hijack this stress response pathway in order for the cell to produce a fluorescent protein whenever the pathway gets activated. To do so, we designed a sequence of DNA that consisted of the promoter of a target gene, the coding sequence of a reported protein, and a fixed terminator. After assembling this sequence, we integrated it into the genome of yeast. To confirm whether or not our modification was correct, we performed colony PCR and also sequenced the region where we expected our insert. We went then on to test our reporter strains on the fluorescence microscope to see whether or not the report protein actually is expressed. We were able to confirm that this is the case and that for some of the strains, the expression level is higher in the presence of pesticide. The research we were able to do is of course only the tip of the iceberg. We planned a screening experiment with other chemicals that are potentially harmless to humans, but still have the capability of triggering the yeast stress response. With this data, we then would have redesigned our reporter strains to decrease this effect. Thanks, Sven. And I'll take over from here. What do we do with the genetically engineered yeast using our hardware? The goal of our project is to make a user-friendly and modular device. Currently, there are very few affordable and compact alternatives on the market. Espresso is trying to address this issue by making a user-friendly and affordable device. We are trying to address also the modularity aspect and the do-it-yourself aspect of this device so that it can be used by all communities across the world. Have you ever seen an espresso machine? What if there is a device which can tell you if your water is drinkable or not, making testing your water as easy as making a coffee. Our device uses the genetically engineered yeast in a capsule. You pour your water in and then the integrated device using the optical density and the fluorescence lets you know if your water is drinkable or not. The espresso device can be broken down into three main components. First 
is the capsule, second is the electronic components and third is all the 3D components which our team has printed in order to fit in the electronic components and the tube. The capsule design is an important part of our project. What we have done is, is that it's leak proof so that we can guarantee user safety and it's also sustainable because it can be reused and cleaned. It can be assembled in less than five minutes and all you need is just a hole puncher. Let's take a look at the video which was created by our capsule designer Ella in quarantine. We decided to make the external structure of our object using 3D printing and for the purposes of this we used a Prusa i3 3D printer. We primarily had to print three 3D components in order to get the external structure. The first is the violin sensor holder which holds the optical density and the fluorescent sensor. The second is the base 3D component which holds the magnetic stirrer and the Peltier cell. And the third is a box which covers the whole object and does not let the sunlight interfere. For keeping the yeast cells in suspension, we need to use a magnetic stirrer. The magnetic stirrer is basically a DC motor on top of which there are two magnets spinning at a variable speed using a variable resistance. This helps us create a vortex which helps to keep the cells in suspension. For the yeast to have an optimal growth, we need to set the environment to a suitable temperature and then keep it constant. We need to keep the temperature in the neighboring range of around 30 degrees. This was achieved using a thermoelectric Peltier element and a TMP36 sensor. The presence of pollutants or pesticides in water can change the growth of the genetically engineered yeast. And this is something we have to measure. The principle is the less the growth of the yeast is, the more light should pass through the vial. This phenomena can be measured through a light to frequency converter and a white LED. The genetically engineered yeast has been engineered in such a way that it expresses a red fluorescent protein in presence of a pesticide. This red fluorescent protein gets only excited in the presence of a yellow light which is between 530 nanometers to 560 nanometers. Using the RGB sensor and the yellow light we can measure this phenomena. The RGB sensor and the light are at 90 degrees of each other because the particles when hit by yellow light emit the red emission at a different angle and we have a higher chance of sensing it when it is kept at 90 degrees. Till now we have talked about the theoretical aspects of our object. Now let's talk a bit about the results. We took different OD samples with different levels of OD and then we used an industrial spectrophotometer to set a baseline or a reference for all of these ODs. And we found out that there was a linear relationship in our frequency measurements and the OD measurements which were very convincing results. A growth curve experiment was done to confirm that our yeast can grow inside our capsule and hardware for which we use supermarket yeast in SC medium. The experiment was conducted overnight and we ran it for 17 hours. Readings were collected in terms of the light transmission which were converted into optical density readings by taking a baseline reading at OD0 and we found out that it was similar to the expected growth curve for the wild type yeast. A preliminary experiment for fluorescence measurements was done using water as the baseline and yeast with inducible strain in SC medium and we found out that it shows higher ratings of red color than the baseline. Also with increasing intensity of light, this trend of the higher red ratings holds. We found out that our sensor has negligible variance which convinces us that our results were significant. So to conclude, we have made our device affordable by buying not only low cost components but also by making the most out of them. We made our device modular which let the user change his device for whatever objective he has set it for. 
the project has been implemented in such a way that it's simple. So it can be implemented just about by anyone and we made our device open source so that anyone or everyone can use it all across the world in any community. So I'm glad to present our project to the iGEM community and we look forward to having your open source contributions so that we can have an impact on the water quality assessment. When the project started coming together and we got our first results, we invited Quentin Morezzi, president of the Fontenier Association, to our lab where we gave him a live demonstration of our device. He then proceeded to give us some useful feedback about the device. His feedback was overall very positive. We view this as a great success, as we design our device with the intention of it being mainly used by the Fontenier. More precisely, the prototype meets the needs of the Fontenier associations in terms of price, size, and simplicity of usage, and could be used for pre preliminary water quality analysis. The Fontenier operators who use the device are equipped with the necessary equipment, syringe, gloves, bleach, that will allow the espresso system to be used safely. Mr. Moretzi also signaled to us that the fact that a test can take multiple hours to run means that even if the device is small and portable, a Fontenier cannot take it with him or her and do measurements outside of a lab or an office. As well, Mr. Moretzi said that it would be required to have an automated processing of the data necessary in order for the Fontenier to use the device. Saving the data on an SD card and bypassing the use of a computer while running the experiment would be a plus. We presented our project to André Horvat, CEO of Swaxid. This was an important encounter since Swaxid is developing a low-tech water filter that is intended to be deployable in communities with limited resources. This means that his feedback on the design of our system came from his large experience in the domain. André really liked the problematic Rapid local generic testing of water quality is a global issue with very little solutions. The Espresso is thus an interesting system that could have many usages. Andre provided us with useful feedback and insights regarding our product, with a focus on the challenges that we might face when it comes to putting it on the market. As we are aiming to distribute the device that contains GMOs across Switzerland and potentially internationally, we must be wary of the safety regulations regarding such organisms. This was another positive and constructive encounter with a professional from the field. We will stay in contact to set up an experiment using our system to test the efficiency of his filter. However, his filter kills bacteria, viruses, and not micropollutants. Our system is thus not adapted to measure the presence of living organisms in water because they would falsify the yeast OD600 measurements. Nevertheless, Andre experiments with coliform bacteria uses OD measurements to measure their presence in water and he would thus be interested in testing our device. Thank you for staying until the end of this video. We hope you liked our project. We could not finish without mentioning all of the attributions because iGEM is not only the making of a product or a system, but it is a team effort. Thank you.